started. Um, so I am Jean Louise Shara, and I uh, will be presenting over this meeting. It's the May 20th Committee on Community Resources meeting. Um, and Laura, will you please call the roll? Sure. Councilor Shara here. Councilor Bidwell here. Councilor Klein here. Councilor Nash. Oh, she's, she's walking. Oh, Councilor right. Nash is on his way in. Fabulous. Um, so I don't see any public that's here for public comment. So as soon as Councilor Nash gets here, um, we can approve the minutes from the last two meetings. Welcome. Councilor Nash. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, Councilor Nash, we uh, there's no public for public comment, so um, I'm waiting for a motion on the minutes. These are the minutes from February 25th, 2019, and March 18th, 2019. Make a motion to February 25th and March 18th. Any comments on them? Any discussion on the minutes? No? All those in favor of approving them? Aye. Aye. No sessions? Minutes are approved. So the first thing on our agenda um, is that we've asked the public health department to come and talk about um, measles in general, where our country is in general, but in Northampton in particular, what our situation is. Um, there, we have a couple of elementary schools that have what I feel are alarmingly high rates of unvaccinated kids. Um, and uh, Councillor Bidwell came to me and, and said that it would be great to just get some more information on, um, on this significant <coughs> public health issue. So thank you so much, uh, Director O'Leary, for coming. Mm -hmm. And also- Jenny Meyer. Jenny Hello. Meyer. Public health nurse for the city. Thank you so much, both of you, for coming and taking time to talk to us about this. Our pleasure. So my intention today is to kind of give you a two-minute elevator speech on what's happening right now with measles, just because I feel like you perhaps have more direct questions for us, and I'd rather use our time that way than me just giving you this two-hour presentation or half-hour presentation on measles. So that's how I'd like to approach it. But feel free, I mean, while I'm speaking, um, if you have questions, to stop me, and I'd rather just kind of break it apart that way than you waiting at the end so we can take it by topic if you'd like. So I did just uh, a couple slides for you and I also printed them out so you have information. Um, and Jenny is a, not, I mean, she's just a wealth of information. <laughs> I mean, she's, you know, she eats, breathes, and sleeps with stuff, I'm sure, more Don't than she'd it. like to. Don't, <laughs> Don't want it, so. Uh, so, okay. You have it up there behind me? Great. So currently, um, from January to May 17, 2019, the CDC has reported that there are 880 cases of measles that have been confirmed in 24 states. This is actually a 41% increase from our numbers that we had last week, and we are, cons we are uh, seeing the rise pretty much between a 37 and a 41% rise every single week past couple weeks, so that's kind of on point there. This is the greatest number of cases reported in the U.S. since 1994, and since measles was declared eliminated in 2000 due to the widespread childhood immunization program. Um, of the 880 cases, about 48 of them, their CDC is saying, um, were acquired because of international travel. The rest of them, 98% of the cases, occurred here in the U.S. So people who traveled were around these pockets of high unvaccinated or undervaccinated communities. Um, so the measles itself is one of the most highly contagious diseases out there. And the transmission factor, which they consider, they, they call it the uh, r naught factor, is one in every 16 people. So for one person who has the measles, 
If we were in a population of all unvaccinated people, 16 people would then acquire measles. It's highly, highly, highly contagious. Um, so the R0 factor is defined as the average number of people that an infected individual will infect while he or she is contagious, assuming that everyone in the population is susceptible to disease. And what I did was I gave you some diseases to compare it to. The norovirus, the R0 factor is 3.7. And we consider that norovirus spreads like wildfire in my industry. It's very, very virulent. And um, it, you know, in a room like this, it, the majority of us would get it through contam cross-contamination. And then we all know about influenza and how contagious influenza is. The R0 factor is only a two. So when we look at influenza comparing to the measles, this is highly, highly contagious. And that's why we're so concerned about it. What, what about it makes it more prone to the yeah. So it's how it's transmitted and how long it stays near. So like what I like to say is if you think of measles as a person sitting on your shoulder, if you walk into a coffee shop, you're there for five minutes. Measles takes a table and sits for four hours. <laughs> like, and, and that's like, and so think about that, like it, and how it's, so what it is is it's airborne and it takes four hours for those droplets to basically like make contact with the ground and like die. So it just lingers. Um, and so it, it just, that's why it's so contagious is because you just, the air we breathe. So those, those droplet precaution diseases are the more contagious diseases out there. So it's in the same vein as like a tuberculosis. Like people say Ebola is super contagious. The R-naught for Ebola is I think less than five. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's like one of those things that you hear about in the news. You know, like Ebola is like crazy contagious, but it is just, like Meredith was saying that, you know, you know, if I have measles and I just go about my business, I will affect 16 people. And it's like, think about how many people we come in contact on daily, like that's. And if you're infected, it comes out through sneezing, coughing, breathing, and talking. Mm -hmm. And like Jenny said, these droplets just sit in the air wherever you're at and mm -hmm. people passing through it, if they don't have immunization, can then become infected. Right. Unlike, you know, like a, a norovirus or like some of the other diseases we're looking at that are, you know, pass through body fluid or feces and have to be like contamination. Like this is like, you don't have to take any, you know, non-hygienic precautions to do it. You just exist and it's contagious. The addition thing too is if you are symptom um, contagious for four days prior to any symptom onset. So that's where a lot of parents of children that are like, well, if my kid's sick and they're not immunized, I'll just keep them out of school. It's like you have four days <laughs> that your child, you have no idea they're sick. Um, that they can infect those people. So, and then how long after they show symptoms are they infectious? Uh, seven to twenty-one days. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, so it's a long infectious period for a full month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is just a. Um, medical lingo question. What does yeah. R not mean? What is that? It's a, it's actually not medical. It's statistical. What is that? Uh, so that's like what Maris was saying. It's a statistical. It's a degree. <laughs> no, so in, in statistics, you have all sorts of things. Like if you read a study, there's like the S factor, the R factor, the R sub not. Right? So it's a mathematical statistical term. That basically, okay. is what she was saying. But um, okay. I know. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I would like to make it more succinct, but I don't know how. <laughs> But, but it, it's roughly, I could say it's eight times as contagious as the common influenza. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how, did, how does something go from eradicated to an epidemic? So that's it, the difference. Is, is the, it, was, it was eliminated, eliminated in the U.S. There have only been two diseases ever in world history that were eradicated, and that was smallpox and a disease that was only ever in animals that I don't remember the name of. So eradication refers to worldwide elimination. We consider a disease eliminated when it's not transmitted natively in a country. And oh, so it was not eliminated, it wasn't eradicated. It, yeah. was, it was eliminated. Yeah, and that's a okay. common lingo thing that's been mm -hmm. happening in the mm -hmm. news, and like I've been trying to do my part to, because I that was something I think that, I don't want to say surprised me, but like what I, I knew it, but someone like stated the importance of that footage. Uh, so even though we declared measles eliminated in 2000, we had sporadic cases, even in Massachusetts. So in Massachusetts in 2011, we actually had 24 cases of measles. So the difference yeah. is, is those are all foreign acquired. Mm -hmm. uh, they are all 
brought into us from somewhere else. They're not native, what we're calling natively spreading. Um, so it has to get to a certain threshold where it's natively spreading at a certain rate to be considered like a disease that occurs here. Exactly. All the way from 2000 to 2014, you would see in the U.S. anywhere from about 20 cases. I think the max was about 100 cases that we saw in those years. And then in 2014, I think we had 650 600. cases. And we actually had a case here in Northampton, I'm not sure if you remember or not, where one of our professors at Smith College did international travel and didn't get her um, vaccines updated. And she brought it back with her. And we ended up giving out 600 vaccines that year. Jenny wasn't here yet. She missed it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I never thought I was ever going to have to deal with measles in my public health career. So it was, it was a, a fast learn for ourselves also in the health department and what we needed to do. We've been planning ever since because we've just seen this uptick since 2014. So like I said, you know, it's not a matter of if it's going to come again. It's a matter of when it's going to come here in, in Northampton or the western part of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I interrupted you. That's okay. No, that's, those are great questions. So we talked about transmission. It spreads through direct contact with infectious droplets or airborne via breathing, coughing, sneezing, what have you. Uh, Jenny mentioned the duration, the incubation period, the infection period. The symptoms, very typical. Um, you see a high fever, cough, runny red eyes, conjunctivitis of the eyes, and then after you um, present with um, the rash. So those are the symptoms of Meredith, you might have this um, somewhere, but mm -hmm. you mentioned that the professor um, traveled internationally and didn't, hadn't updated his or her. So, I mean, do you have to necessarily if update? You, if you are traveling internationally, you want to make sure you go to a traveler's clinic and you have all the proper vaccines that you need. So, um, and we will get, next slide is vaccination. So, um, if you were born before 58, you're assumed or presumed to have proper vaccine because measles was widespread, so um, you have enough immunity to it. 58 and on, um, you know, when was the- It was, hold on, I had it, I heard it because okay. this, keeps, Thank this you. question yeah. keeps coming up. Um, so the vaccine was introduced in 57, and then in the, if you were someone who would have gotten vaccinated in the 60s um, for a while from 63 to 67 like the first iteration of measles vaccine was from a killed virus rather than a live virus and it has found to be fairly ineffective uh, but there was from that 1957 to 1963 time frame there's still enough like native measles spread that they weren't as like, kind of similar to the people prior to 57 um, so from that 63 to 67 time period, they're saying though people that are freaking out about it, it was less than 1 million people who received that kill vaccine before they updated it to a live vaccine. Um, so those are the people who might be at risk of re like needing to have reimmunization because their vaccine would be inadequate. Um, after that, they, they introduced a one dose vaccine um, series and then they later- In the late 80s, the late 80s, yeah, like they did it to two. So, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Do you know what age they vaccinated in 63 through 67? Because I was I was born in 61. So <laughs> yeah, we like were on the same age. Months, <laughs> I, I, be in that. I do not know. Yeah. However, what, what we recommend doing is, A, if you have access to a booster shot, there's no harm in any of our vaccines to getting another one. Um, or you can get a blood test like a blood draw so like if you go to your physician for your annual physical or like or like on draw your cholesterol panel say can i get an mmr titer add-on and what they do is they can look for those immunity levels in your blood um yeah. the reason we don't do that with a lot of younger folks is it's easier to just stick them with another shot like little rolls and to, to check for immunity um but yeah so that it says you're immune you're not immune or it might say you're borderline um, and if that's the case, they'll recommend a booster. So the recommendation now is the two doses. Um, they say anywhere from 12 to 16 months for the first dose, and then between four and five years for your second dose. That's just the guidelines for the schedule of, of the two doses, but there is some wiggle room for that. Um, they also say you're 93% immune with your first dose, and then it goes up to 97% immune with your second dose. Um, but like Jenny said, check your blood um, to see if you have immunity, if you're going to travel, or just get a booster. That won't do any harm either. Um, okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Just how how dangerous is it in terms of mortality? I ask that because I've had folks say measles. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. We used to have yeah chicken yeah. pox right, chicken parties, parties and, and measles that. parties, yeah. and if it was if it's so dangerous, so why did we encourage <laughs> immunity spread by encouraging it's people? It's funny to get because it? it depends on where. I read like a bananas article that was like debating what the denominator should be mm. factors into the mortality rate. Right. On it's between one in one thousand and one in ten thousand. They tend to say one in one thousand to one in two thousand is generally like the numbers you most frequently see circulated. So that's where people are like, we're in the middle of an outbreak and there's not it's not been a child who's died yet. It's like, well, we're getting getting close statistically. Um, that being said, the the hospitalization rate can be higher, and I mean just because something isn't fatal doesn't mean it's not going to cause long lasting. Like one of the biggest side of the two are deafness and then encephalopathy, which is swelling of the brain. Um, especially because most of the people who are getting sick are young children. That's incredibly, you know, that can be a lifelong disability too. I mean, it's not necessarily like if someone lives, it's considered a successful outcome. So just so. modifying that just a little bit, let's look on average of those, you know, 30 to 100 cases that we saw between 2000 and 2014, there was about one to three deaths every single year and mostly in children. So every single year someone was dying. And that was just with a low number of measles cases. And in that, that number of cases, um, what was kind of the age range? Was it mainly young children that were getting sick or were there also immunosuppressed? I didn't really dive into people? the mm -hmm. age range, but if I was to guess, really young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just kind of along those lines for anyone who's going to, who's here, who's going to be watching this. So one of the concerns are for children that are too young yet to be vaccinated, so infants generally, mm -hmm. or for people who have some sort of immune issue yeah, that they can't be vaccinated. So they're the most vulnerable people. Right. Absolutely. And, and what, um, so kind of like the inverse of that are not factor we were talking about, are the, is the rate required for herd immunity, um, which is the rate required uh, if you have like a room of 100 people for that room to be protected if that disease was introduced. Um, so like you said, it can vary. I think for months it's like 87% would be herd immunity or something. So it would be much lower because that R0 number is much less lower. So for measles, that, that's a herd immunity rate. You always hear that 95% buzzword. It's between somewhere between 90 and 95%. Um, because it's so infectious, you need to have a much larger swath of your population that's immune to protect those who are not immune. And what you get into is in that room of 100 people, odds are you're going to have you know, two, three, four of them who are too young, immunocompromised, and can't get the vaccine for medical reasons. So that's why we, that's that's where that like kind of concern factor comes from is that like other portion, you have a lot less room for uh, as far as continuing to protect your population. Um, we linked to the Gazette article. There's a really great website you can go to called the Fred Measles Simulator where you can simulate, um, and I think the overlay is for the greater county where Springfield is, and it'll show on a Google map what um, a measles outbreak looks like with a herd immunity of 85%, and then you can kind of like slide the bar around, um, so it's for 95%, and then you can slide it around to play with how the outbreak spreads. Um, for each percentage under you are, you can see that the cases just continue to proliferate versus kind of dying out. Mm -hmm. so, and it's kind of interesting because it puts it in the community, you know, under the map that you know. Right. So mm -hmm. it's, I thought that was a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Right. Um, so it is a two dose vaccine, it's a very safe and effective vaccine. Um, we talked about the effective rate. School requirements for MNR vaccine. Uh, 50 states have laws that require children entering child care or public schools to have a certain vaccine. Massachusetts allows for exemptions. We allow for um, medical exemptions and we allow for re religious exemptions only. Do all states have exemptions? For medical, at least. For medical, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we don't have philosophical. No. We don't have philosophical, no. So then on um, the next page, I don't know if you can you probably see it better up on the screen, is the fuller graph on state school vaccination exemptions. So it just breaks it down, what states have what, medical or religious exemptions only is in the red, philosophical exemptions in that teal, 
exempted students um, exclusion during an outbreak is great, so on and so forth. But if you want to um, just take a few moments to really look at that and then ask them to ask them some questions, we'd be more than happy to try to respond. So only state law allows for exemptions. This is not a federal law. Um, it also establishes requirements regarding the exemption, exemption application process and the implications of an exemption in the event of an outbreak. Since so much of this depends on if there is or is not an outbreak, what constitutes an outbreak? Or so in Massachusetts, it's three cases. Three cases mm -hmm. in the state? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why when the big speak was considered an outbreak last year in the state, right. because we had one at Smith too. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot of times it's just that threshold is very low, so we can mobilize resources. Mm -hmm. That that three number allows us to, for example, in meningitis be a lot of insurance providers for our students, uh, our college students only cover meningitis B in the case of an outbreak, the vaccine. So that's what we're like, it's an outbreak, you have to cover it now. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of decreases, it increases our the availability of resources and decreases some of the barriers to accessing them. I've um, been hearing a lot about certain religious communities that are um, exempted, I suppose, but that's where cases are developing. Is that not influencing policy in states to change a religious it's, exemption? It's a very interwoven thing. Um, there's, I'm trying to think, it's the not gonna have to get back to you on the name of the website, but there's a really great website that shows um, statements from a bunch of clergy that have had historically um, issues with certain components of vaccination, either the schedule or the makeup of the vaccine or their personal beliefs. And what's interesting is the majority of religions, like large umbrella, are fine with it. It's where you kind of like filter down to like some of the more nuanced sex in religion that they have um these beliefs and it's very like they're very narrow um so that's been one of the kind of issues with saying like you can't necessarily say it's blanket in one religion um, a lot of attention in new york has been given to this ultra orthodox jewish community but if you dig into it it's a very small sect of this ultra orthodox jewish community and a lot of ultra orthodox jewish leaders are coming out saying like whoa this is this is not um what we believe like our larger beliefs are compatible with vaccines they will cite scripture and cite things um, but it's kind of that like as with anything religion aside when you drill down far enough you will find people who are going to reinforce what you want to hear and most um, of the religious exemptions are honestly a philosophical exemption right. it's just you know in massachusetts <coughs> we don't allow for it so there it is they're out and unfortunately with the religious exemption currently you don't have to have it notarized. You don't have to have a signature by any clergy. You just and have to declare that you're not. And one time, too, you have traveled have to, yeah. with you through school. Right. So we're starting to look as a, at this as a system um, to try to address this. But yeah. You're, it, however, what we do is we do require a letter um, that is, you know, doesn't, like we said, doesn't have to be notarized, doesn't have to be signed with a parent, does have to type a letter stating this versus some state simply just have a checkbox. Like, check. I have sincerely held to lose beliefs and check a form. And it has been found that for the the population that use religious exemptions for philosophical purposes, altruistic or not, that the more bar barriers you put into place, the, the lower those fall. So at least, like, you know, our system isn't ideal, but it's not as easy as it could be to put that in the kind of. Um, so is Oklahoma the only state that has no exemptions? Oklahoma, the medical, Oklahoma, West Virginia, California, and as of last week, Maine. And Washington State is is it still in process I now? Think it failed by one Did day. it fail? I feel like mm -hmm. I heard, yeah. Mm -hmm. it didn't pass. Maine passed by one. Mm -hmm. Passed the Senate. Has the, has the governor signed it? No, but it's expected. It's expected. Yeah. Um, so the, and those all still do allow for medical. Right. And do you know, is it a state preemption kind of situation? Can a local municipality make a decision about how? I do not know. That's, and I mean, I think it's finding any information on other states because our health, public health systems are set up so differently from state to state. Right. It is so hard to even find where to start because like some, you know, public health boards governed by county and it's, it's 
Maybe. I think it's the best answer. <laughs> but like we, it, it would be a looking for nipples in a haystack. But, but in Massachusetts, what, what is the local discretion? Of, There's of, no of, precedence of that's been set in Massachusetts for that. We're really trying, I mean, we're asking our um, public health colleagues, um, our attorneys about this. I mean, everybody's talking about yeah. it. Again, um, there's no precedent for it on a local level. So right what? now it's being handled uniformly from city yeah. to town to city. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, over the years, that have been which is at the state level mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and village exemption. But as far as Maria told me, there's not anything on the, I don't know if Maria or Susan Lett is a position with the department. Mm -hmm. um, there's not anything currently pending. Um, well, and, yeah, go ahead. Well, my only question is, if, if, if three statewide is enough, if, if there were one in a, in a city, I mean, that could, that in itself could be very serious, even though it doesn't meet the threshold of three in the state. But even so, there isn't the ability locally to do anything until the state hits the, the, the level or the number of three. Is that, is that right? As far as changing our... As, as far as some, some of these additional powers um, I mean, I don't necessarily think they would require an outbreak in the city. Uh, however, I think it's balancing the best way to go about accomplishing our end goal. Um, because, so to get a little on my soapbox, my senior thesis and my undergraduate program was on how to reach vaccine hesitant parents. Um, and the answer is not <laughs> legislation or um, what we want to tend to do, which is shout at them about the need to vac like vaccinate, present them with, you know, facts and figures and all these things. It's um, to have community conversations and, and to kind of provide these non non threatening venues for them to have their concern. Because what what we've kind of found is there's no like necessarily defined terminology, but you have a swath of parents who are what we call vaccine hesitant, or as the state has kind of decided to start calling their program, they lack comp vaccine confidence. When you think of that in the terms of what you hear on Facebook and social media and in the news in terms of anti-vaxxers, that's a very small subset of vaccine-hesitant parents. Um, if you think of vaccination on a zero to 10 scale, zero is no vaccination, 10 is my kids are fully vaccinated. If you ask a parent who's vaccine-hesitant, like where do you fall on this scale, most of them are like between a four and six. Um, and it's been, so th what the research has shown is, is having these conversations and presenting things to them in a way that validates their concerns and some of their fears and the emotions around that without validating their information. And, and building that trust is the best way to get them to start to build that confidence. If there's an outbreak of disease, there are certain parents that are like gonna sit like the seven, eight, nine on that scale and they're gonna see an outbreak and they're gonna vaccinate their children. Um, what we worry about is those parents that are between a four and a six, that as they start to hear all this stuff ramp up, all of a sudden they see legislation and policy and people coming at them, like saying, you have to do this. And you know, you want to try and reach them and not like, push them down to a two to the point of like, they're never going to come back to have these conversations. Um, and a lot of the research that's been done around this has shown that it's not necessarily like what we think of as the common, like scary, uh, propaganda you see on a lot of social media it, it's just they don't have time with their clinicians to have these they feel judged like anything in parenting um, oh there's a lot of judgment running around um, and like I I told a couple of people I told the reporter when I was speaking to the Gazette like this this was my passion in undergrad I'm a nurse when I was pregnant with my daughter there was a week I was on every mom blog I could find terrifying myself about vaccinating my kid I know better like, I, it went against everything in me, but I still have this, like, this isn't something I can go back from. And so I get those parents that have those concerns. And, and at the end of the day, those parents aren't choosing to not vaccinate their children because they think they're going, they, they want to harm their child. They don't want to harm their child's friends, the majority of them. So it's, it's finding ways to facilitate these conversations. I went to a, a statewide group um, where we're talking about how to start trying to facilitate these things. Um, and, I, and I think that's where you know, in the event of an outbreak, and if we have a couple hundred cases here, or, you know, something else that together, or we can start talking about some of these measures. But I think doing it is like a, just like a first step. It, it might not be the best mm -hmm. message. What percent of unvaccinated 
children come from hesitant <coughs> families as opposed to like never going to do with families? I don't. I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. I, w I would imagine it's. The like, is that the population we should be trying to? The never ever's or like the, no, the I question, mean, no. The question for sure. Those are the ones we should be trying to reach and have outreach. And I feel like they're at least fifty percent, if not greater. But that's just my gut assumption. That's not. I don't have any hard facts on that. Okay. So there's a significant number who are. Has yes. been, but not convinced that for it's sure. And I think we do a disservice by like putting everyone's emotions and feelings in mm -hmm. one bucket that we see is the loudest mm -hmm. that gets the most coverage for, you know, that we see on the iPad with social media. Cool. I like to check in with them frequently to see are you still screaming this loudly about this? And yeah, they are. Um, and they're the ones that do your algorithms pop up all the time. Um, but a lot of parents aren't going to be like I'm nervous. Like I have this year. I think it's safe. I think it's mostly safe. But I don't feel like I have anyone to talk to. I don't feel like I have this venue. They're not generally going to be the ones that are coming forward. So it's we're trying to find ways to find them. Um, Will you spaces. talk um, about what has been done in Northampton, what you're doing, and how you're doing it? Is it through schools? I think that's the next bit. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. Perfect. Um, so our local response here to the outbreak is we have put out a measles alert, and we um, put it out in the media. We made sure that every child went home with a measles alert. Um, both in private and public schools. In daycare. In daycare, yes. Yeah. I got my own butter. My daughter's daycare, that was fun. <laughs> oh, did you really? Yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, here's this question. It's something I felt right <laughs> So um, we put out a music alert. We're doing a huge media campaign. We put out press releases. We're trying to get in the paper almost on a weekly basis with some type of op-ed or um, some type of information. We are connected with Smith College really closely. They are um, having one-on-one -on -one contact with anyone who doesn't have um, proper vaccination, and they're advocating for them getting the vaccine. They're offering free vaccine clinics. They're requiring proof of immunity to receive their grades and or to register for classes each year, uh, next year, excuse me, and if they don't have proof of immunity and they have an exemption, then they have to um, update their exemption also and or also. So they didn't need proof of vaccination to attend? They, they may have. Um, they generally do, but if they have an exemption on file. Okay. So even if they have an exemption? They didn't need mm -hmm. proof of immunity. They, no, okay. they had to, no, it was required that they submit their vaccine record or they have an, uh, the exemption, but Oh, okay. Yeah, you didn't need proof of immunity, and now you need proof of immunity. So that's, they're checking for that. So, so, so that would override someone's <coughs> religious exemption at Smith? No, if they have a religious exemption, then they have to update the religious exemption. That wasn't required before. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So annually, they need Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a new requirement. And that's so to get grades, I'm sorry. That's right. Yeah, they had to do it to get grades. So they, they need either the annually updated exemption or, or proof, proof of immunity, immunity to get credit. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that, since they're likely over 18, they yeah. would provide that mm -hmm. for themselves. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't go through there. Yeah. yeah. And just to go back to the 2014 case that we had, um, again, a lot of people were affected at Smith College, and it was a 98% vaccination rate that um, voluntarily got the vaccine after the possible exposure at Smith College. And there were some high there was a high school student who also um, was at risk, she didn't have immunity and was taking classes. And she actually had to be quarantined instead of getting immun an immunization at that point. And we were offering free vaccines for the students who might be, who are under unvaccinated at the high school level who also go to Smith College and we didn't have anyone take us up on the offer for the free vaccine. So there was a, quite a differential between those making their decisions of their own body were of age versus the parents making the decision for them. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was eye-opening to me to see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the public schools, they're requiring now as of next year that you have to update your exemption, whether it's medical or religious annually and, and as you said that's a letter that actually has yeah. to come from yeah. the parent. Mm -hmm. right. but prior it was like one letter was good for all of school Medi medical has always been, has always been annually. annually but now we're requiring mm -hmm. religious to be up to now is that because 
Or public health required that, or the school department? School department. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we can't speak to our private schools. Right. As far as yeah. right. Um, Jenny's been in touch with Northampton Area Pediatrics. They're having direct one-on-one -on -one communication with the parents of the children who are on or under vaccinated, and also they're recommending getting the vaccine. Northampton Area Pediatrics is also considering not taking new, uh, not taking patients who don't have proper immunity, just because of the risk to the young children. Who, right, and again, this is all their policy. We have no influence on this. It's just something they had a sign up. Uh, last week that they're considering this. Holy mm -hmm. Dickinson Hospital, um, they're living, eating, breathing measles mm -hmm. and planning for it. Um, we have a public, the health department has a public health trailer that we do vaccination clinics in, frequently flu clinics, or we do health education in. They've asked to use our trailer as a staging area, so if anyone comes with possible measles, they don't go into the ED, they go into the trailer, so they don't infect other people who it's are an exam. It's a full mobile exam. Yeah, right. So it's not we're not just like it's not that easy to Oh yeah. So <laughs> the first time I went in it, it is a full like primary care one room to mobile mm -hmm. exam room. So how do they catch the person before they enter the E D? So a lot first of all they're asking if you have measles like symptoms to call. They have a twenty four hour hotline. So that's the first line of defense. If that doesn't happen and someone comes in and someone notices they have measles like symptoms then immediately take them out to the trailer. Mm -hmm. So I have a question, just based on this page and what you've shared, mm -hmm. and I'm asking this out of curiosity, sure. not as a critique. Sure. Uh -huh. um, you talked about conversations yeah, being we're the most important thing, yeah. so tell me more yeah. about kind of <laughs> the kinds of conversations and how you yeah. make those happen. So it's a, it's a longer term, um, that's why it's not quite on there yet, but so out of the, um, panel that I went to on vaccine confidence that we had in Holyoke, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, maybe longer now. Um, two of the people who I connected with there, one is an assistant professor of epidemiology at UMass, and the other is a public health nurse at UMass. Um, and they recently, without me talking to them, did this um, at their, both of their children go to the same daycare, and they had noticed a um, anti-vaccination pamphlet that was posted at their daycare and they're like, whoa, whoa, like this is, is this your belief? Like what's going on? And actually we were able to convene a meeting of all of the parents of the children along with the daycare director. And they were saying like, didn't necessarily, they might not have changed anyone's beliefs um, in that one conversation, but they were able to get the, um, the daycare director to take it down and like understand. And they were able to basically emphasizing, by emphasizing doing good for your community and like really explaining some of these things that we've talked about that are not the herd immunity factors um, and just listening to some of these concerns. They, the parents felt more engaged and I started reaching out to them more. Um, I've started to be in touch with them about how we might do that here and we're looking for where we might um, start to try and have these conversations. Um, I discussed um, the opportunity with the Montessori school and she said if you know, they come upon a group that seems open to something like this. Uh, it's just trying to, um, I think probably the schools or the pediatricians are going to be the best places to find these groups. Um, but we're still in like the very early phases of brainstorming kind of to this. Do you feel like people know what the symptoms are? I mean, I know you've shared with us yeah. what the symptoms are. I mean, I feel like someone yeah. born after a certain age, yeah. just like I hope my kids will never know what right. the chicken pox symptoms right. are, but I know what they are. But right. I don't really know what measles. Right. So I think there's been um, a, some public messaging like from national media and whatnot and we could probably do a better job of it um, there have been <coughs> alerts and releases that have gone out to providers and clinicians as well as it's been included in a lot of our like annual updates and training um, and to kind of show that it's, <coughs> and we do this with any public health thing um, disease that might be going around um, such as like if we have some mumps cases that have happened like we start to kind of do this training with our providers the state will release press alerts or not press alerts but these releases to them to just basically say like hey this is happening like put it at the front of your differential like if you see a kid with a rash like be thinking of it because a lot of our physicians too like you said like, haven't ever seen this um to show that that is kind of working in um you know i got recently it said for the one confirmed case of measles we've had in 2019 we have investigated 87 in the state he said last year in contrast, um, we had zero confirmed cases and they only had 24 suspect cases reported. So a lot more people are thinking about it. Um, and that's, you know, we're continually, uh, one of the points that I raised to Maria is I was like, can we kind of get a, 
uh, a debrief of that occasionally. So we know like if there's things we can tell providers, okay, like pull your jets a little bit on you know X, Y, and Z. But it, a lot of it is education. So you know our, our ED clinicians are are thinking about it more. A lot of our pediatricians, primary care doctors, and we're all like, brushing up on it. And a lot of us are. It's always kind of the thing. public health balance, right? It's yeah. like how much do you right. make clear this right. is, you know, something you really need right. to pay attention to and how do you not yeah. like over alarm people. Yeah, and um, I had a, a, a case in a, another um, municipality where I worked that was possible and it was like, you know, they're like, but they have a rash that's like, but it ends up, you know, I went something or something to start in a different area. And like, there's a, prog a natural progression to the measles rash and we'll start in X place and go to Y place versus just shutting up or there's other things like the, Know, that can rule it in or rule it out. It, it is complex and it is, you know, so we want to message the vague, the, the more like, you know, easily diagnosable symptoms to, to everyone in general, which is a rash and cold symptoms, especially this time of year. Get it checked out. We, you know, we probably don't want to even date everyone else with that messaging because we don't need them dying saying, I'm fine and not going to see their provider. Right. Um, so I think that that's kind of the general message. And the medical providers in the hospitals, yeah. they all have signs up there. If you have symptoms of A, B, and C, then see me do this or what have you. Um, we did it with Ebola, we do it with influenza, um, so whatever. Tick borne disease. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, yeah. it's all about getting, you know, just keep on pushing the information out the best we can. And I'm not sure, I haven't circled back with NAP on this, but I know a lot of different um, pediatricians in the Western part of the state are all taking their own um, approaches to how they want to deal with this, like saying, like, if you have these symptoms, call us before you come in, stay in your car, come in the back entrance, mm -hmm. um, something like that to, like, reduce the risk of infection. I also know NAP, currently for any child they have who is un or under immunized, if they present with any symptoms of any vaccine preventable disease, they don't allow them in their waiting room, they have them come in a separate entrance and go straight to an exam room to decrease the chance of transmission. And do they, when that family calls to make an appointment, it's, is yeah, that they, where that gets screened? Because yep. they see yep, on they their screen. Yeah, the vaccine record, yeah. Okay. Oh. Hi. <laughs> um, and how long, you know, you, you get the vaccination, and at what point are you immunized? Is there what kind of time frame? Does it take a week, two weeks? I think it was. So I remember we asked each other this yeah. and found the answer. And I, don't quote me. Somewhere between three and five days is. So if you take the scenario: if you have someone, a kid goes to school with measles and exposes a bunch of other people, for example, if a child was unimmunized. Um, they would generally be excluded from school for the next 21 days to like run that incubation period, or they can choose to get vaccinated. If they get vaccinated, they can return to school, I think it's somewhere between three or five days. So that's when the vaccine like starts to work enough. With most any vaccine, it's about two weeks to reach like your maximum immune status, um, which is why some people are like, I got the flu shot, and then I got the flu a week later, and the flu swab said so, and it's like, that's just bad luck. Um, it takes your body a little bit to like figure out what's going on and not that response. So, um. Did we make it to the end? We did. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what more can we do? Um, and this, again, this is a system, not just the health department. This takes the village to, to do more. Um, you know, we think about, Jenny has discussed this with me, requiring vaccine exemptions to come to the health department. Um, you know, if there was an outbreak in the school and we couldn't get in touch with the school nurse or the lead public health nurse and, and safety director, we would have no idea what that population looks like. So having the exemptions all come to the health department could be a, a huge factor in determining the outcome. Um, and is that in your discretion to ask now? We're looking into that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think so. The it could be a regulation. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But potentially that's something that you would negotiate with I mean, we'd like it to, <laughs> we'd like everyone to be on board to have buy-in for it, um, but, you know, the health department does have the power to make a regulation. Mm -hmm. There are, we need to make there are certain that. states mm -hmm. that require this, mm -hmm. um, that's where I got the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so it seemed like a, like we're talking about, like it doesn't necessarily violate someone's freedom to get a religious exemption, but every time you just add a little something. Uh, and having the, the 
data in a centralized location, it additionally makes it easier for us to do some of that community outreach in a, you know, in a way that is not easy, but you know, we know we're facilitating the right conversations with the right messaging versus just like, versus until us having access to that information at a time of crisis for everyone. Another thing to consider, you know, today it's measles, but I mean, we have re-emerging infectious disease going on. Um, we really have to be mindful of our under unvaccination rates and what's coming down the line. So considering hiring a part-time public health nurse that works for the schools and or the health department to have their pulse specifically on vaccine and help to decrease that rate could be a, new, a huge help. Because like you said, if we were to house that in the health department, mm -hmm. it would be you know, a big deal undertaking and forming, yeah. forming these groups and whatnot. It, it's a lot of planning, a lot of time. We didn't make this and I'd be using it because my only full-time job, unfortunately, is not. Mm -hmm. um, but it would very much be our public. Um, and another thing that we thought of is, you know, we require vaccine status for children in the schools, but we don't for staff or volunteers in the school. And again, with such a high under or unvaccinated rate, I think it's important that we have that data also. Update exemptions yearly, which is being done, require a sworn affidavit or a signature by clergy for the religious vaccines, something to make it a little more difficult, it might only reduce the under under vaccination rate by one or two percent, but that's pretty significant when we're talking, you know, ten percent, four percent, so on and so forth. Do some states do that already? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And would that require state legislation? You can't do that locally. No, we could do that locally. You can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then continue to educate and inform. And you know, I think the counselors, uh, Councilor Bidwell, you'd ask, what is it could city councilors do? I mean, you could really be advocates in your ward and uh, talk about vaccinations. Jenny has offered, you know, to give you or provide you training and language that you could use um, when speaking to your your residents in your in your ward. I know you mentioned private schools. Mm -hmm. Is say the campus school is it held to the same standard that Smith is? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They are. Um, our our private schools are held to the same requirements public and private schools so the public schools can't just choose to do their own thing however um the the annual religious exemption updating that that's a movement through the school department so our private schools are going to be not held to that okay any other questions yes um like somebody talked i i i do a periodic newsletter blasts out to my ward and yeah. goes beyond. Do you do you have something um, similar to what you've been preparing for op-ed pieces or, or I, not you, 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 necessarily like we have the op-ed we wrote but I can certainly if you want to collaborate to work if, on I, if, I, if I draft something up you could, you could yeah yeah for help sure. me yeah be sure it's accurate <laughs> absolutely <laughs> And if people want more information, where's the best place for them to go? Email me. Okay. Just more call me, but email is okay. quicker, easier. Doesn't they get that already call? General information, they can just go to our health site. Okay. Our website. But this is this is a big part of my job. This is what I'm here for. Is is a lot of providers only have that, you know, five, ten, fifteen minutes to hold to their own. I can I can take much longer than that. Um, similar to what uh, Councilor Goodwill is saying, if you know, you're doing any community meetings or anything like that. I think we we get yeah. underutilized, right? You know, because you each of us has our own list serves for right. awards and things like that. Right. Have the health department to just send us those kinds okay. of announcements, and we can write right. them out to. Okay. And that both ways. If you guys know places in your wards that would be, like I said, like we're in very early phases of these ideas, and we're looking for, you know, I don't think the first thing we want to do is do a huge thing of, you know info session of 50 some odd people like if, if you know small communities that that would be willing to start with us and that's a safe space we thought uh, you know a month ago about doing a public forum but we just didn't think that we we would be able to connect with those who were in the hesitant stage i think we'd have a lot of people who might have spoke up about anti-vax and that would have 
made them not feel safe to speak mm -hmm. about their concerns. Mm -hmm. So if you have smaller pockets of those people that might be just hesitant, mm -hmm. and we have a safe space just to have a dialogue, that would be great. That's, I think, where we'll have the largest impact. Okay. Mm -hmm. And would you recommend that we sort of contact those pockets first, or that we suggest them to you? Oh, no. I think if you contact, you yeah, if you contact You're them, and then if you, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest thing, is, is one of the most often cited reasons of people not vaccinating their children is a lack of trust mm -hmm. with their provider, with the system, with everything. So the more that we can do to provide that fidelity of trust versus an email from a you know, relative stranger that never met me versus you know they trust you and you're a conduit. And so having that you know, come together and saying like, this is a person I know, I trust, I've worked with, you know, to keep you safe for lack of a better word. Uh, I think that you know everyone is entitled to their feelings. The people who are who, who are have contentious um, thoughts and feelings and emotions, they're entitled to those too, and, and they're entitled to have a space where they can back and hear what's being done as well. Um, and it's not saying they need to be separate forever, but we do need to just you know conduct that trust the same way we'd be in a private exam rather than inviting someone in to just you know go crazy for a little bit. Thank you both yeah. so much. We, we knew this was going to be a, yeah. a, a, we'd have a lot to say yeah. and hear about. So thank you so much for taking on this time. Just one, 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 one oh, final question. Yes. So I, I'm gathering you're, you're, you're not recommending that we encourage our legislators to from jump state, on this and do anything. From a state level? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, do it. Absolutely. I would love to. Well, so what would be your wish list? No um, religious exemption. That's a, that's the, the mm -hmm. to, to follow, to follow yeah. Maine's example. Mm -hmm and just eliminate religious exemption, yeah. period. And it's gonna be painful, anything is. Mm -hmm. um, it, and I think, but that doesn't excuse not trying to work through it. Um, someone pointed to California and said religious doctors who are writing right. bogus medical exemptions because everything else is gone, and so right. now how do we know if public health outbreak happens? It's like, that's, that's you're so looking at the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Right, and so I think that, you know, like we were saying, like the, the that population of medically fragile people needs to be preserved and we should do everything we can to help protect them um, and they are the priority in the, you know our legislative efforts is, so i think did you share numbers about massachusetts how many re religious exemptions we've seen so i have an interesting sorry i it didn't make it an emeritus thing but the presentation <coughs> went through, i have a graph uh, that shows exemptions statewide from 1986 to 2018 and, around, and i can provide this to you guys so it's not local, um, but it's a state, a state level. So you can yes. see how, what was interesting is when religious exemptions passed medical exemptions. Um, and the other the other thing worth um, just mentioning real quick is you had mentioned our uh, exemption <coughs> rates for our income last year. Mm -hmm. So the important thing to keep in mind is that that is a snapshot of one point in time. Um, I have heard, I spoke to the person who does, who, um, is in charge of getting that data. And she said, our schools, look, most of them look much better this year. It still hasn't been released. I haven't seen the official numbers, but they are better. Does that mean that those children who are now first graders are fine? We don't know. Um, so it is worth just keeping in mind that these numbers will fluctuate year to year. So you know, a community that you want to look at as a model from last year and say, well, this community had a 98% vaccination rate. This year, they could be this. Like, it, it is an ebb and flow. It is a snapshot of one age of child. Um, that is the other thing that if we had, if we held our health records, the vaccine exemption records in the health department and had a staff member who was able to properly devote that time, they could track a class over time because those exemptions are refiled every year now. So we could see, did that kindergarten class do better? If we started to do targeted outreach, are our vaccination rates increasing in a cohort of, you know, we can follow the cohort through school. Right. Whereas right now we're just looking at five-year-olds and then five-year-olds and then five-year-olds and we're neglecting those six, seven, um, so that, that's worth keeping in mind the, the you know, benefits and efficiencies of the data that we have currently. It's good we have the information, but we can't live and die by it. If our numbers get better this year, it doesn't mean like, right. measles is not a problem anymore. Mm -hmm. not really, so, so just put some context around the numbers. Just one more, I know we have yeah. other business questions. Just one more question <laughs> on, on the numbers. I, I was looking at, it's probably the same Taylor yeah. exemption yeah. rates by, yeah. by school. Yeah, 10 and 13 percent. And one, of, one yeah. of our schools had a 13 percent exemption yeah. rate. But there's a separate column that says unimmunized, and it said 0%. Right. Can you? So there's a difference between unimmunized and underimmunized or partially immunized. 
Um, I'm immunized as a child who's never had any vaccination at all. So if, if our unimmunized rate is zero, that means every child in our school has had at least one. Has had at least some. At least some. I, I see. Um, okay. you can, your religious exemption or your medical exemption can be to just one vaccine, although top of my head, I'm not sure of any medical MRV because it's live versus an active. Like, but so there are, we also have what are called under immunized, um, which could be a number of things. It could be a child is an immigrant and their vaccine schedule in their country was different. The vaccines available to them were different, so they're on a catch-up schedule. Um, and so they might have had one MMR at school entry, but not two yet. They would go into that number of our un or under immunized. Um, parents that are choosing to vaccinate their children on a delayed or spaced out schedule could fall into that, um, as well as parents who are opting for a religious exemption to just one specific or a couple specific vaccines. So a child could still have their Tdap and their polio could be deficient in MMR. So you can be, you can have a religious exemption for one type yes. of vaccine, but not. Well. Yeah. And, the, and what would, I mean, an example would be like, and it's, it really depends um, on your certain religion, but one example would be the MMR vaccine in the very first origins of its creation was de derived from aborted fetal cells. Um, so some Roman Catholics have said that that goes against my religion. The Pope has issued a statement saying it's fine. Right. Um, but however, like we were saying, those umbrellas mm -hmm. don't necessarily always dial down to there might still be someone with a sincerely <coughs> held religious belief who, who truly that is not compatible with their definition of their religion. Right. Um, Even if we know that it's no longer pertaining. Correct. Correct. But if that's what their clergy is telling them. So that, that could be like one vaccine exemption versus others. Okay, last call, folks. <laughs> oh, I got a bunch more. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, again, thank you so, so yeah, much for coming. Really this has been really just so helpful and important a lot. So we really appreciate that. Very helpful. Okay, thank you. Yeah, any questions? I'm Okay, thank you all that are here. Um, maybe some of you were here to learn about measles, but if you weren't, I assume you're here to talk about zoning. I know Ms. Mish is here to talk about zoning. Um, so we have um, kind of two sets of zoning things to discuss. The first is um, an ordinance to rezone five parcels from URC to CB, uh, Central Business. Um, and then there is sort of a set of um, marijuana zoning that we're going to talk about. So let's, uh, if, is anyone here interested in the URB, um, sorry, the URC to Central Business? Oh, okay, great. So let's just, let's do that. <laughs> First, if that's okay, Caroline, I assume you want to come talk to us about this? Sure. Um, so um, you can see the um, five um, parcels on the screen. Um, we had a request, uh, the, the impetus for this change was based on a request from Historic Northampton. Um, they, the total number of parcels they own is split between Central Business and Urban Residential C. And in order for them to have the greatest flexibility about functionality at the museum compound, uh, they really um, needed more flexibility with um, commercial type uses, which are allowed in central business. So we talked about um, rezoning those parcels because, again, they're split zone. One of their properties is already in the central business district. Um, and whenever we look at doing um, a map expansion, we look at whether or not there are other properties that um, don't make sense in their current zone and maybe should be rezoned. And uh, um, many times those are uses that are non-conforming in the current zone in which they're located um, because it just historically been the same thing forever and ever. Um, the reason why um, we look at opportunities to 
fix or tweak some of those um, non-conformities is because the whole idea by uh, behind having a non-conforming um, use is that um, on a policy level you're saying as a city as long as it stays non-conforming you're saying eventually you want that use to change so that it is conforming to the zone in which it's located so when we look at opportunities for rezoning we always look at whether it makes sense to have to maintain um, a property in one zone versus another um, based on sort of what makes sense for long-term um, expansion or feasibility of reuse and that kind of thing so um, that's what triggered us to look at more than just the number of parcels that historic Northampton owns and so we just look generally in this area. Where does it make sense to tweak the boundary? So um, down Market Street, there's a property that's um, on the west side of Market Street that's owned by um, Joe's Pizza. It's a parking lot. So it's a commercial parking lot, but it's zoned residential. So um, it made sense to go ahead and fold that in. It also creates opportunities if uh, the property owner ever wanted to rebuild or build a new building there and change the use. The central business is um, very flexible in terms of the height and the um, build to um, allowances within that property. Um, it also allows commercial parking, so it would it would no longer be non-conforming. Um, going up Bridge Street, um, there's. Um, across the street from historic Northampton there's a dental practice that is on the other side of a large um, historic home that's residentially used and of course um, looking at the dental practice if we kept that residential again the policy on the books would be oh we want this to eventually turn into residential and um, it just wasn't clear that there was necessarily um, um, an essential um, vision for that for, for um, encouraging the transition and there's no currently we don't know of any plans of the property owner to um, convert out of you know commercial medical office use essentially that's and it's 69. also what's that that's 69 bridge yes and it also abuts um, a high or density residential um, parcel so it sort of is a transition zone anyway um, so that's why those far, um, five parcels are in the package in front of you. We reached out eight months ago to all the property owners. I only heard back from um, one property owner on Market Street at that time, just sort of putting it out there. Well, how, what do you think about this? Would you, we we're considering it. Um, and so I had email correspondence with um, the property owner for Joe's and um, um, she was fine with that, and then we didn't do, we didn't proceed and in, in um, introducing this change for a while. Just um, went on the back burner, um, and then we sent out notice again for public hearing, and we haven't really, we haven't heard any responses back from the other property owners except for a store of the of course. So just to clarify, sorry, super quick. Um, so it's. Three, the three parcels, 58, 66 Bridge, and 57 Bridge, are owned by Historic Northampton. 58, 60, yes. Mm -hmm. And then 69 Bridge is the dental mm -hmm. practice, and then 34 Market is owned by Joe's. Right. So those are the five. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sorry, Kelsey, do you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question. Um, with regard to the Market Street property, yep. I know that we always talk about how we don't want to do spot zoning, and right. I see that this is immediately adjacent to central business right um, but it's it, it sounded like the way that you described it it was almost like well it's owned by Joe's and it's a parking lot and they could potentially if it's rezoned it could be used in a different for a different purpose at a later point by the business but I know that immediately adjacent to it on the other side are residences so it seems like it's almost like a little pocket there that you would be changing the zoning around and based on who the current owner is and it, that just sounds a little bit like spot zoning to me but maybe I'm missing something yeah so spot zoning is um, uh, typically a term used when you're 
creating literally an island of a different zone um, within a, a surrounding zone, and it has no um, basis in long-range planning, um, not tied to any plan. This is just sliding the boundary one more parcel. We consider that a commercial parcel because it's used for commercial uses. It doesn't matter who the owner is. Um, so we're just really taking a line and sliding it to the other side to recognize the fact that it's used commercially and not residentially. But the other effect is that if in the future um, the owner or some future owner wanted to do something else other than having just a parking lot, that opportunity is available. And I mean, being a residential lot, if it stayed in a residential zone, it could be redeveloped. It doesn't have to be a parking lot forever either, but central business zoning um, is more flexible in terms of the way things are built um, and how many, what types of uses you could put to that person. But since it is a kind of uh, line right there, <clears throat> and on the other side of the parking lot are residences, um, I would imagine that residences would prefer to have a parking lot than a, you know, some kind of business necessarily right upon next to them. And so I'm just wondering about the, that slide right there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably personal preference. I mean, I hate parking lots. I don't like looking at them and they create lots of heat and, <laughs> and they're not very interesting. So, but I could see, you know, someone might say, oh, I know that's a parking lot. It's been here since I've lived here and I don't want change. So, um, you know, I'm sure that some people could feel that way too. So, Carolyn, just to clarify, so if, if that lot had a residence on it now, yeah. you probably wouldn't be considering sliding that zone over. It's just that it's already a non-conforming use for right. that. Right, exactly. For yep. that zone. Yeah, and we're not anticipating that that would change at all, but when we take this opportunity, we think, okay, well, if there's a non-conformity, it really could be, if Market Street is, you know, is the original downtown, it has a lot of commercial use on it, so it makes sense that you would wrap something that's used commercially now into the commercial district. But by no means are we trying to encourage someone to change that from a parking lot or anticipate that it will. It's just sort of making sure that it matches <coughs> and which is located. And so Joe's, that's across the street from Joe's? Mm -hmm. But so Joe's yeah. is URC. Yes, so that's non-conforming too, but again, it's not, it doesn't abut the central business line. So if we just jumped over right. a residential use and that, that, that would be more of a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, as far as the Joe's lot, I'm comfortable with that idea because actually the, there's an apartment building, so there's it's commercial right up until the parking lot as you go down Market Street. And, um, and that really does fit the CV zoning. It, things are built right up to the street that there's you know property you know built structures are right next to each other um you get up to the parking lot it, uh, the, on the other side of the parking lot there's i think it's a residential building but it's also built right up to the street in um in the way like a, an apartment building in a central business area would be constructed um and i i spoke to the owner uh, megan stanton and i know you spoke to her as well and um and she seems okay with it um that for her she has no intention to stop using it as a parking lot for joe's and that um but she likes the idea of like it, it could be flex you know she has that flexibility the fact that it's urc right now she really couldn't build anything there because the side set setbacks are 10 feet and then a 20 foot setback or, or 10 foot from the street and 20 from the rear, you know, she could put like a tower in the middle of it. So this is actually, so I, I think it's a good thing for, you know, the, the property owner for the future. And also, I, I, I think it lines up with um, our, the zoning for that particular property. Uh, I, I too think it makes, makes sense but though we're not encouraging by doing this we're not encouraging any further development there we're saying 
if it should happen, we're fine with it. Right. And I think it's you know consistent with everything we've been saying since going back to sustainable Northampton. This is a part of town that has historically been developed and been commercial. And uh, it would be a perfectly fine location for more intense commercial development if that should ever be the case. So uh, it, it makes makes sense to me as well. Um, I just want to say thank you to Councilor Nash for always doing such due diligence and talking to residents in the areas of these things. It's Why thank you because I have more to report there. <laughs> okay. Um, so I but I also to, to back up. You know, Carolyn. You know, has been. You know, that she sent letters. She's been doing outreach. Mm -hmm and that um that she's contacted some of the property owners here and the family dentistry uh, they haven't responded to you and they haven't responded to me um yeah so that it, it's been a little difficult getting a hold of the the people whose properties uh, might be affected here well there's some people here that would like to speak on this um, i don't know if your properties but um if you could just come and state your name and um, i just have some clarifying questions about it yeah so i don't know if maybe if carolyn can answer some sure. of them that would be great so um greg and i are actually um property owners on uh 31 graves avenue so our property directly abuts um historical northampton's property um so could you for me carolyn ex yes. um identify which one is currently CB and which one is currently URC? So the original house, so the one, see the, the yellow green line? Original, yeah, the green line is the central business um, boundary. So okay. the, uh, the, pro the structure to the west of that is the, um, with the main museum is um, CB is central business. Okay. And then the next building, which is, I think, a, a little white house. Right. Yep. Yeah. And then that's where there's a driveway to the back parking yep. lot that all building that. and then the next building over they also own yep. that goes up so it you can and the barn see. in the back so three properties right. are right. currently our three buildings are currently urc okay right and then the parking lot is part of that parcel too yep. so that's part of um that that would come into the um central business zone okay as well okay so, and then um, since they are the one that proposed it, do you know what their intent is, what they're looking to do with the property? Um, Specifically, did they talk about any of that? So they they talked about ideas, nothing set in stone, yep. so I don't want to present you yeah. know, what their plans are. They're really trying to find occupants for the, um, for the old house, and I can't remember the name of the house, the, the White House mm -hmm. that we were talking to, in the middle. So there are three buildings along Bridge Street. Yeah. And, um, you know, not on a permanent basis, but almost like a caretaker, or also potentially have artists in residence mm -hmm. doing things there. So really just to create, um, and that those are just um, a couple of concepts, but a way for them to generate some income to help offset the cost of maintaining all of that property. Yeah. And they couldn't do those kinds of things with a, a non-CD? So thing? some of them, no. Some of them, that because it would then sort of act more like a hotel, and that's not really allowed in the um, urban residential C district. Um, so, you know, they're they might also want to rent out. They're renting out office space now, actually, in that other building, which is not allowed. Um, so they um, they could continue to do that as well, and also transfer that to that other structure. So. Does that help you with your question? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I mean, we um, we've been in contact a lot with Councillor Nash, and it, for us, we're not for or against it. We're just trying to gather information and have a better understanding of what's taking place in our neighborhood, because that um, historic Northampton is used a lot by a lot of people that live in our neighborhood um, on the weekends after you know because um, it's a wonderful green space and so if it's changed to CB I think that some people are concerned what the infill could potentially be in the long run um, so right now historical Northampton owns it and they're not my understanding is that there's no historical regulations for them they can act like federally so they have more um, ability, flexibility essentially to do a little bit more of what they want. Plus if they're given CB for all of it, 
Um, and then eventually, what else, if something did happen or the property was sold, what would um, the impact be? So it's more um, for us, we're just like gathering information. Um, and I do, I think, you know, they need to be able to um, generate additional um, revenue to support the facility. So well, thank you for yeah. coming and yeah. asking those questions. I'll add as well that whenever it, you know, in the unfortunate event that historic Northampton can't sustain itself anymore and they need to sell the properties, which obviously we all hope that that doesn't happen. But um, we do, in the zoning, have a requirement for a 30-foot buffer between commercial uses and residential uses. Now, in this area, there are a lot of places that don't currently have that. But given that there's a, these lots are deep and there's no building all the way back to the rear where it abuts the residential, that buffer requirement would kick in if there were a transition of building on those parcels. So the portions of the property that back up to Graves and um, the Bridge Street School would, um, at, uh, under current zoning, would um, be required to maintain um, a buffer strip to those residential lots. If they were being built. Under current zoning or if it changes to CB? <coughs> Meaning throughout the entire zoning code, wherever there's um, a, a break between re a residential and a commercial district, the, re the commercial uh, uh, property owners required to maintain that buffer. So I just meant that in the zoning now built into it for no matter, I mean it could be here, it could be in Florence Center, it could be anywhere where there's a, a commercial zone that butts up to a residential district. Okay. Um, can I go yeah. first? I had a follow-up question. Uh, Fred Zinnock, Ward 3B. Uh, my main question is what is 57 Bridge Street and how do you explain changing that to CB? Um, it's a lot right now. It's a large um, residential structure um, home. Is that Augie Wojcikowski? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So why would that be CB? Um, so a couple reasons. Um, again, sort of looking at making um, a boundary that makes sense and allows for transition if at any time in the future they um, wanted to have more I mean that's a large home we we know um, all over the city that um, this has changed and not just in Northampton but other places maintaining a large single-family home um, is very difficult especially historic home so um, and it's a large parcel there are two reasons why we think that it makes sense to incorporate that into the zoning. Well, three. I guess the first being um, drawing the line all the way up to the commercial um, dental office makes sense. Incorporating this um, building in between would allow the owners to, um, you know, take on a mix, potentially create a mixed use uh, um, within the building if that helped to um, provide income to maintain that structure. It also, Central Business District also comes along with Central Business Architecture review requirements. So if any facade changes were proposed for the exterior of the building, they would be protected under the local um, Central Business Architecture review um, for any modifications. So that would help. Um, um, ensure that at least the, the um, visible facades of that um, historic structure remain or are not altered in a way that is inconsistent with the historic character. Um, it also could allow additional buildings on the property, again, if the property owner um, wanted to pursue that. Um, and given the urban nature of this section of Bridge Street, we felt like it made sense. What do the owners say? Uh, we have not heard anything from really? the owners. Nothing. Mm -hmm. I have spoken with one of the owners. So um, their concern is um, worried about tax increases, and I actually didn't have that answer. If a property went from URC to CB, with I would think if you could do more on it that and its proximity to downtown, that it may have an impact and. I advised um, uh, Susan Krieger 
she's one of three sisters who owns the building to contact um, uh, the assessor's office I'm sure they would have the answer to that and maybe you have the answer what is the, <laughs> that's hard to um, say. The, is, the assessor is based on use and the valuation of the use the assessors don't look at zoning okay so but the uses would be changing or, or could be changing but that then that's a time where it would the valuation would be um uh changing re potentially depends on the use so if i took my single family residence and i decided to divide it up into four units you're going to be assessed as a four unit so yes your taxes are probably going to change i don't know if they'd go down or up because it's all going to be based on valuation at the time if i decided to open a medical practice then I wouldn't be a residential use, but our tax um, levy is the same for commercial and residential. So it's, um, I mean, being in Northampton and having this, this zoning change, from what I've seen, um, I don't think it's gonna have any effect. The zoning itself by itself is not gonna have any effect. If someone takes the step to change it, then of course, it'll be reevaluated at that time. So I think you answered it for me. So right now it's a residential uh, single family home. Mm -hmm. And as long as they keep using it as a single family home, it'll be assessed as a single ha family home compared to other single family homes mm -hmm. yep. surrounding it. Okay. The, um, and I've encouraged her to also call you. So um, yeah, the other thing is she mentioned she has a non-conforming structure at the left back of the property i don't know if it's a garage or a little cottage or something it looks like it's right on the property line and i don't know how this would it would make it conforming right it would make <laughs> we have zero setback <laughs> right but you just mentioned where oh it would be conforming because all around it would be central business in yes, this right. if this proposal goes right. through right okay whereas with that 30 foot buffer that would apply to <coughs> historic Northampton mm -hmm. and and that was the follow-up question I had what would the, the buffer look like I mean what is it trees shrubs um, so it's supposed to be an um, a, a vegetated screen mm -hmm. there isn't a provision for um, so that means you know creating essentially a vegetative wall mm -hmm. um, the zoning allows for applicants to go to the planning board for a reduction in that dimension to 20 feet but then to do that you have to do you have to add a fence or do take other measures that essentially create the same benefit that a 30 foot depth would be um, versus a 20 foot depth and one other question the you mentioned that this so the the Bates Mansion would now be have to go any alterations would have to go through the historic commission, right? Is that right? Or yeah, the, well, down to, what is it? Now there will be two. So yes, it would go. It would go to Central Business Architecture Committee. Central Business. So Architecture. and and you'd have to follow the guidelines. And the same with Historic Northampton. Exactly. So there actually would be more oversight over the yes. historic structures. Right. any yes just as a point of information at, at this point this central business architecture and central business always exactly overlap they're yes but we have you have to um, <coughs> you have to separately specify you have to it specify in the code yeah so that's why it is expanding with it so that's okay. why there's this right. is a two-part okay. yep Councilor Nash so Carolyn, I would be happy to work with you on some time for uh, on some policy to reach out to a butters because I, I know right now that right that the for a map change it is the property owners <coughs> that are contacted yep. and I think this is a this is a great example of how we we it would be helpful to have some sort of policy to be able to reach out to the people on graves um, there's all of these people in this um, this condo complex next to the dentist office 
I, I don't think that I, I don't have them on my email list. That's that's why these people are here. Fred is you're within 200 feet, I think. We'll walk it later. Okay. <laughs> but I, I think it would be good if we could come up with some sort of process to let the abutters know because especially with this level of change, it's not like it's going from URB to URC. You know, the setback changes. You know, we're talking about you know different heights, different. You know what I'm saying. So you want to codify what you already do such a great job of? <laughs> yes, because I think it would be helpful. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> okay, so any other, do you have any other questions or no, Fred? Okay, so, um, so this is 19.025 North to rezone five parcels from URC to URB to include parcels in CBAD. Um, so again, these are, this is 34 Market, 57 Bridge, 69 Bridge, 58 and 66 Bridge. Um, is there a motion for the positive recommendation? I would make a motion for a positive recommendation on Ordinance 19.025. Second. Okay, it's been made and seconded. And uh, before we vote, this is, goes from here. It will be going to, is it right that there's a joint, this is going to the joint planning and legislative matters? Or no? no, it was already scheduled to go to legislative matters, so I think it's going June 13th. Is that right, Laura? Right. Okay. So um, the one for this Thursday um, is, the marijuana uh, package and then short-term rentals. Okay, so this will be going to the meeting after. Right. So if if there's still questions that you have or there's more you want to talk about, this will be at the June 13th Legislative Matters meeting, which is held here. Five o'clock? Yeah, five o'clock. Um, okay, so <coughs> motions on the floor. All those in favor? June 10th. Oh, I'm sorry. June 10th. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I said 13th. Legislative matters, June 10th, this room, 5 p.m. No more discussion. Uh, motion's on the floor. No question. Sure. You, okay. Well, I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm going to vote in favor of a positive recommendation, but I'm still hearing stuff and, um, you know, doing that outreach piece. So um, just saying that. I'm sure they'll look forward to seeing your legislative matters. Yeah. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. No objections? Objections? Passes. Okay, so now we're moving on to 19.054, 55, 56, 57, and 58. And these are all nice to see you, Fred. around marijuana. Um, what's the preference? Should I read them all at once? Um, you did a good job. Um, for voting, I guess, but yeah, I don't. I don't no, they're distinctly different okay. between the others, so I'm not sure that that makes sense. So we'll do them one at a time. Okay, so let's start with 19.054 foreign ordinance allowing marijuana testing and processing in four business districts. Uh, Northern City, Northampton, Massachusetts, Friday, Chapter 350, Code of Ordinances, City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by modifying allowances under the buy right uses within the central business, entrance business, highway business, and general business districts. Ordinance be ordained by the City Council of City of Northampton that was in the CB, Attachment 9, EB, Attachment 10, HB, Attachment 12, GB, Attachment 2, Districts, Table of Use, and Dimensions. Dimensional regulations, a new role be added for uses by right, and this is it. Any marijuana independent testing laboratory or other testing labs only when located above the first floor behind a street front unit reserved for all allowed commercial use, which is at least 30 feet deep or in a building that does not abut on a public way maintained by the city. Um, so let's, if we're gonna do this one at a time, let's uh, get a motion. Approval. Second. Okay. Uh, discussion. Oh, no, we have one more person. <laughs> we have one more person. Um, so you want me to explain this? <laughs> yes, so, please. Um, when we first, um, when the city council first uh, adopted the ordinances around retail marijuana, 
uh, there wasn't specifically an inclusion for testing labs. So this, um, and because everything else related to marijuana pretty much has to be held out, it's not, we can't necessarily rely on um, the other sort of typical uses that are comparable to this. So um, except in the, except because this is sort of considered part of manufacturing, the testing piece, it could fall under that rubric in the office industrial and general industrial districts, but um, not in the commercial districts because we don't allow the manufacturing or cultivation of marijuana in HB, um, CB, EB, and um, GB. So the idea was to allow testing. We have a, we've, we have 18 signed host um, agreements. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get 18 businesses in Northampton, but um, we think that it makes sense that we could also have testing because if people are manufacturing here, why not have sort of the whole chain of, um, of, of uh, production and, and use um, in Northampton. So, but the idea is to allow this above the first floor because testing isn't necessarily a retail interface. So we have a lot, we have other restrictions in these districts that um, really only allow commercial uses on the first floor and say residential on the second floor in, or in the back. So this is sort of a parallel language to other uses that we think are not um, the best for street front activity to be right down on the, on the street level. Any questions? Bill. So, so the, these are these are ors, not ands. It, it either it would either have to be located above the first floor, or it could be behind a, a street front unit reserved. Right? It doesn't. Right. It's not that both of those conditions have to apply. Right. So, um, right. If it's not above the first floor, but if it's behind another use, then it's not sort of taking up that. Um, sidewalk street front interface that um, is best better used by uh, office or retail use and, it, and it's use. provided that the commercial use behind which this testing would be is 30 feet deep yeah is that is that, yeah. is that my reading it right yeah and we have the same language for residential uses as well okay what do you know what um, testing entails in other words, is there going to be any heating up of the product or any kind of effluvia from the I, testing I'm process? pretty sure that the answer is no, and I don't know that from personal experience, but we've talked with people who um, want to establish a testing facility, and it's, it's they, the way they've described it is it's like a chemistry lab, except you're not necessarily using, you know, intensive heating elements you might have something like a bunsen burner or something like that but not big machinery so it's not so much the machinery question to me one of the issues that is coming up in places where <coughs> some kind of facility is proposed is the question of the smell and so yeah. we're talking about you know commercial areas and a storefront and i mean how much is there a possibility if at all that any of the testing you know involves um you know, the, the movement of smell, smoke, I don't like think that. I don't think there'd be any smoke, from what I understand, I don't think there'd be any smoke. Um, I think mostly it's looking at, um, you know, using other tools other than necessarily burning to figure out what the compounds are in the plant. Um, it's certainly not to the level, I mean, part of this package is to address some of the concern about large production facilities where you might have odors coming off because you have a large concentration. Um, I, these are going to be small, um, from what I understand, these are, th there's not going to be a lot of stock here. It's just going to be, they're, they're required to do, essentially, I think, spot testing of a product. And again, I don't pretend to be an expert in what all the testing requirements are, are supposed to be under the CCC regulations. But um, what we've been 
told is that it's really like a small chemistry lab and that even if they are using things that would um, you know would heat um, product that it's on a very small scale it'd be helpful for any more where is this going from here so legislative matters and board. Board. Mm -hmm. so if there's a way in which we could get a little bit more detail about what this testing means okay. and what the processes processes are around it that would be really helpful okay thank you and if do we have other regulations around use of chemicals or um, you know if if there needed to be some sort of ventilation system in a testing facility I think it's building code right Councillor, let's go to Councillor Nash first. Sorry. Well, we have all of these ventilation requirements that are coming up later in the agenda, so these wouldn't apply to the labs. Councillor yeah. Bidwell. Well, that was my question too. I, I was, I was, I was wondering why they, why they wouldn't. And you're, you're saying it's small-scale operations, but from what I understand from the Netta folks, it's. The, the testing procedure as prescribed by the CCC is not just spot testing, but every every batch, as I understand it, goes through some some testing process. So I, I really, I, I too would hope for some additional information before legislative matter. Okay. And because I would wonder why it might not be appropriate to, to have this, the same um, uh, air, air handling situation for, for, for these facilities, or maybe if they reach a certain scale, it would be appropriate. Yeah, I mean, um, I'll see what I can find out. I know that this, um, from the research I've done about um, the odors that are coming from the larger productions is for, because of a certain period of time in which the plants are growing and there's the quantity that's growing is what um, it creates a concentrated odor. Okay. Yeah, and also uh, Leslie was saying, Leslie Laurie was saying the other day that the Cannabis Control Commission may be upping the, the amount of testing that goes on. So that what the batches are getting smaller, so that there'll be a lot more testing rather than, you know, like I got 100 plants. That's, I, I, I didn't quite understand it all, but it indicated that more testing could be coming down the pike. Any, any other questions on this? Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that little thing meant. <laughs> there's, a, there's a little pinky point over here. So just so existing zoning would allow these facilities in GI and OI. Is that what you're saying? Right. Anywhere else? No. So just just these and GI and OI. And, and well, one of the other ordinances is in the Plan Village plan to allow testing. Right. But right. that right now, Plan Village doesn't allow anything. So um, this would put everything um, in the um, allowed use category for Plan Village. Okay. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Um, so I'm hearing that there's a desire for more information. Um, Currently, we have a positive recommendation. Um, everyone comfortable with that, or would anyone like to amend that to a different recommendation? That's a good question because my my kind of uh, response at this point is to give it a neutral recommendation and let legislative matters kind of process any more information that is delivered to us and to make a final decision. So. I don't know. I would agree. I, I, I think I, I would amend my, my motion to be a, a neutral. Okay. Neutral. Do we have to vote on that amendment? I think the second has to accept the um, amendment. I accept the change. A friendly amendment. And then we can just vote at this point. Yeah. Okay. So we now have a neutral recommendation on the floor. All those in favor of a neutral recommendation? Aye. 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 No objections, no abstentions. Okay, so that moves forward to Can the make a general comment. Is that possible? I don't see why not. I, I, I guess I just want to say I think 
we're faced with, we're not just dealing with the zoning, we're dealing with, we're, we're expected to have some level of expertise in something like the processing of marijuana. And it's a whole new world for us and we're just learning from scratch about these things. So it's just hard for us to, you know, I feel bad that we're, you know, drawing this out and we're asking you for more information, but it's, you know, we have to get up to snuff around these kinds of issues. Okay. Um, I assume communities across the Commonwealth are having similar, you know, conversations and it's not, they, they don't know more than we do that. <laughs> um, We're the experts. That's <laughs> scary. <laughs> Uh, 19.055, an ordinance allowing marijuana. Did we actually call it to a vote? Did you guys? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. Okay. Unanimous. Unanimous. Or neutral. Um, <laughs> or unanimous. Or unanimous. neutral. neutral. <laughs> um, an ordinance allowing marijuana production slash cultivation, testing, and processing in the PV district. An ordinance. City of Northampton, Massachusetts, brought in the Chapter 350 Code of Ordinances. City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by modifying allowances. Under the by rights uses within the planned village district, um, be it ordained by the city council of the city of Northampton, that within the PV planned village um, district, table of use and dimensional regulations, a new row be added for uses by right. Any marijuana manufacturing, um, cultivation, or testing. And it's a different guy. All facilities must incorporate both high efficiency particulate air handlers with activated carbon filters and exhaust systems designed with vents that force the air at least 10 feet above the roof line of the building. Alternatively, other technology may be used upon finding by the planning board through site plan approval process that such other technology will, to the extent practicable, practicable <coughs> limit odors from marijuana in any place where the public or clients are present. Um, would someone like to make a motion? Move approval. Uh, move a positive recommendation for 19.055. Second. Is that a second? Is there was a second. Second. I was going to give Elise a chance because she was <laughs> over there. She's busy right now. <laughs> a mumble second. Okay. It's been made and seconded. Um, discussion. Uh, so we don't have, um, currently we don't have any, uh, production, manufacturing, and plant village um, for marijuana. So we took this opportunity to um, write um, an ordinance to amend that. There are still, there's still two, two building pads on the south campus um, that where the industrial um, uses are intended to be located. Um, um, they could potentially be used for cultivation or production. Um, the North Campus is pretty much built out, and I don't see that this would be applicable on the North Campus. So it's really, um, this um, came about because someone asked if they could approach Mass Development to do this, and it's not currently allowed. Um, I don't know that anyone will follow through and, and um, seek out um, one of those paths for mass development, but this just um, allows that, or if any other use changes in the on the south campus, and someone wanted to move in and do um, marijuana cultivation, so this would be indoor cultivation. Um, then um, this would be allowed, but this includes technology for air air filtration. The reason why it's so specific is because the research that I've done indicates that um, carbon filters are the best technology for this type of compound that's in um, uh, the plant and that um, uh, it's 99% effective at, at um, removal of that. Um, the other piece of it is for the re the reason why there's a specificity about sort of a stack that would blow the air above the roof line is that the rest of that that's not able to be filtered would then dissipate quickly in the air. It would be above where people are walking or um, conducting business. That, that's a good 
that like one percent or what was it? One or two percent, right. Yep. Okay. Questions? Councilor Bidwell? So is this a technology that is in operation elsewhere and we know the we know its effectiveness? We do, but it's also been so there's um, there they use this um, in Colorado. Um, I think this is a system that, and I don't, I can't remember about the dissipation above the roof line. There wasn't that level of specificity for the Ryan Road or Burt's Pit Road project. Um, but they're using um, fairly certain what they landed on was this carbon filter um, exhaust system. Um, but the so the type of compound is not new. Um, that is so. Um, it's just that um, that I guess that's the element that really creates the odor um, that some people are concerned with. Um, that's very strong, and they're um, they're referred to as terpenoids. Um, I think I pronounced that correctly. But at any rate, so um, the carbon technology has been um, tested for years. Uh, as it relates to this kind of compound. Can you um, pinpoint the paths that you're speaking of? Where are they exactly in the... So the they're on Earl Street. There's one, so there's a pad right in front of um, um, Colmorgan, <laughs> L3, KEO. There's a pad there. There's a pad on um, Earl Street. So the you know the detention basin with the rock in the middle of the, um, right next to that there's a pad and then you get to DCA which is the um, furniture uh, cabinet company a uh, carpentry company um, so those are the two there um, and so the closest residences would be across the street on Earl there's some right. residential yeah. properties there. Mm -hmm. And how tall are those residential properties? Two, well, two story, a, maybe a third. Yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm wondering how how many of you know we have the ten foot stack on top of the building, and whether that actually goes higher than. Well, so that that's a slope on the Earl Street side for the state hospitals a slope. So the houses are down below with the building pads anyway. Um, so, you know, you you have a one-story building, probably that. I'm not sure exactly where that would come across, to. But I'm just sort of thinking of BCA. I'm sorry, I'm hesitating. I'm just sort of thinking about BCA Volts Clark Associates. That there is on the same rise, basically, as where the net, the development pad would be adjacent to that, and that's already higher than the structures across the street, as far as I can recall so you know if you take that as sort of the one story example and then 10 feet above that then you're well above the residences Councilor Bidwell it, 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 one of the other things that makes it hard to get our hands around this is this this is one one sliver of the of the overall uh, uses table um, where so where else right now is manufacturing cultivation? This this was specifically only in the office industrial and general industrial districts. That, so this would this would add PV to those existing districts. Yes. And would these filtration requirements apply in GI and OI? So that's part of the next. Path. That's the next one. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then I just just to clarify the. Um, the Burt's Pit Road site was a non-conforming industrial use in a residential district. It is Ryan Road, I think you're talking about now. Yeah, it's Ryan Road, I'm sorry. Right. You're thinking um, of, it's um, the pit, what's it called? The name of a business. Right, right. 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 Sorry okay. about Just that. Yes, it's yeah. Ryan Road. 1010 right. 10 Ryan Road. <laughs> so um, that was in a residential district, but it was a pre-existing non-conforming industrial use. So that's why the that manufacturing just healthy was able to get a permit there um, 
but otherwise it's only allowed in the office industrial and general industrial districts. Okay. Um, the filtration systems that you know I, I know we're going to keep talking about. How are they sort of regulated? Like, have, do they get tested periodically? Have there is a maintenance requirement for um, <coughs> you know you have to change the filters. Um, there, but there's nothing built in that says you know you have to um, test them. But they there are these systems that you can buy. I mean they're you can buy these industrial scale systems, um, and they come with you know specificity about what the care and maintenance is. But no, there's no independent tester that goes around. To follow up on that question, so that means that there's no enforcement, as it were, of whether or not a company is being responsible and changing their filters according to a schedule. I mean, would it would the building inspector's yes. um, office? Be yeah. So the let's order? say there's a complaint. And then the building um, officials who were called to the complaint. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, would then go and say, okay, tell me what you're doing with your filter system. You know, when's the last time you changed your filter? But we get to oh, the we didn't do it last yeah. year. Oops. And then put in a new filter and hopefully that's So it's complaint it. based, as is other yeah. clients. Okay, any further questions on 055? No? Okay. Uh, Councilor Nash. <laughs> well, I, just thinking about it, the complaint based thing, a way of approaching it, um, and I don't think it gets addressed here, but I don't think that that's really, um, what is it? it it's it, it, you know that it's inviting people to keep the filters in until they start getting complaints and then they change the the filters out and um, that it, if there were and and we got and the building inspectors got to go out if if there were just simply a way that there was some way that we they could prove that they switched the filters every so often whatever the requirements are and they send a note in to the building department, I filled it out, it's all done. The inspector doesn't have to go out. We can assure people that, you know, well, you're calling, because we know we know whenever odors are going on, that neighbors will, some neighbors have more sensitive noses than others. We heard it at the landfill. I, I hear it around my neighborhood about the, the wastewater plant. Um, where else have we heard it? But we had sniffers out at the, <laughs> that we're sniffing stuff that we don't want to go there and if there were just like you know the the filters had a, a shelf life you know or a, a life you know of being useful that we'd have some way to enforce that and it just takes us I mean I think I don't know that it would be necessary to put that in zoning it's not really right done, it's not but I zoning. think that it's easy enough for when an applicant is coming forward for a building permit to say here I'm proving that I'm putting a system in that it could that at that stage you know they're gonna have to show what system they're installing and um, it could be tracked that way the other thing that I'm thinking of is you know we have to sign host agreements with these um, folks that potentially it could be also hmm. you know written into a host agreement um, but I think, and then I just want to sort of touch on the, the um, subjectivity of smell, and that's the reason why these ordinances are not written as you can't smell something, because everyone has a different sense of what's um, disturbing, what's, you know, um, noxious. Noxious, <laughs> and how noxious is it? You know, it's only a little bit to this person. It's, and so I think it's too subjective and too complicated to try to, create a threshold for when someone's in violation based on smell. Right. Um, so that's why we went to um, really more of a, um, a standard that, you know, a technical standard say, well, this is what you have to do because we know the technology there is supposed to scrub, you know, 99% of this. And at least this would be a complaint-based system that would have a remedy for it, right? So if 
if the complaint happens and the filter hadn't been changed. Right. Okay. So You're using the cheap filters. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Just want to make a general comment. Again, this for me falls into this vast gray area around um, marijuana regulation because we just don't know enough. I mean, I hear you saying that in Colorado these are used and they're used successfully, it sounds like. But I, I guess I'll vote yes on this one, but I feel like there my vote is with a caveat that, you know, if down the road we're getting consistent complaints, we're going to have the city council would have to revisit this and just possibly re-legislate. And I don't know how that will work at a point at which, you know, there's a company that's already established in that location, but it's just, it's really hard, I think, for us to know. We don't have a lot of precedent. We don't have any precedent in Massachusetts. So it's just very difficult and frustrating when you say It's kind of exciting to be on the forefront. I mean, this, you know, it all has to start somewhere. Yes. <laughs> for the positive spin on that one. Okay. Any, that excellent point, though. Um, <coughs> anything further on this? Uh, so there's a positive recommendation on the floor. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 No objections. Okay, that moves forward. Um, 19.056 norms amending the requirements for medical marijuana operations <coughs> by adding air filtration in ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, probably in the chapter 350-11.64 uh, code of ordinances of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by modifying site plan requirements for medical marijuana manufacturing. <coughs> ordinance 11.64 amended shown medical marijuana operations shall meet the following criteria. Uh, buildings must, in taking out, be ventilated and changing it to incorporate both high efficiency particulate air handlers with activated carbon filters and exhaust systems designed with vents that force air at least 10 feet above the roof line of the building. Alternatively, other technology may be used upon finding by the planning board through site plan approval process that such other technology will, to the extent practicable, limit odors from marijuana in any place where the public or clients are present. Um, so this, um, the reason why we're doing medical separately is because that's the way the code, but right now everything is still separate from the adult use and medical. So we just need to cover the bases for medical until such time as those things are merged. So that's adding language specifically for medical versus the adult use, which is the other um, ordinances. Okay. Move to approve. Did you have a, you have a I'll, I'll, I'll second and then we forward with the positive recommendation, I guess, yes. is what I need to say. Okay, so no further discussion? Yes. 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 We've already put it off, didn't we? No, I don't think that's Okay, was on the second. Floor. So that was on the floor first. Yes. <laughs> so th this would specifically be manufacturing yeah. of medical. Mm -hmm. For me, when I first read it, requirements for medical operations, I thought maybe it might be at the actual dispensary. The, the, the body of it at one point does refer to medical marijuana manufacturing. Could we just say in the title of the ordinance, medical marijuana manufacturing operation, and be, be consistent <coughs> so that others aren't confused yeah. like I was to think that maybe it would be more broadly construed than manufacturing? Yes. So both in the title and then down where it says amended show medical marijuana manufacturing operations. Mm -hmm. So there's clarity there. So you're proposing an amendment, mm -hmm. and that is that in the title. In the title. And I'm the one who changes the title, so. Okay. Just, just, just insert me medical marijuana manufacturing operations. Just okay, so adding so right. manufacturing in the title. <coughs> and in the body as well, did you say? Yeah, okay. down there it says amend is shown medical marijuana manufacturing operations. Shall meet the following criteria. Okay, so that it's already fined and covered in there. Is that what you're saying? No. Okay, there are two places right, right we're going to be there. Okay, add just manufacturing just, just here as well. Just for clarity of what we just down there. Okay. Is there a second on that amendment? I'll second that. Okay. We have to vote on the amended language. Right? All those in favor of that amended language? Aye. 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 Um, for the Only discussion? Yes. So, 
in, in, in what zones would medical marijuana, the medical marijuana manufacturing would also be in the same GI, OI, yeah. EV? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the language here, I, I keep going back and forth. It's virtually, it's much the same as the um, draft before all facilities must incorporate, right? Yes. It's just specific to the medical. It's just why do they look different as I'm going between the two? They've, one's got a lot of blue, the other one's got a lot of... It's, it's like there's two different drafts of the same thing. Does that make sense? Well, the... the or maybe on your black and white it shows up. Different people of mending... So, uh, um, Councillor Seawald wanted to specify that if there were alternative ways to address <coughs> the smell, that you could get there would be an out to go to the planning board mm -hmm. and so that can't shows up in blue because he wanted he added some language there so that maybe is why you're seeing the different colors showing the different people who are editing okay but it's the same one yeah okay <laughs> it's what i read right yes yes mm -hmm. okay. but it just looks like it's two different drafts when it's really not it's the same language for both yeah thank you any further discussion on this ordinance? No. All those in favor of a positive recommendation? Yes. Aye. Aye. No objections? Okay, that one moves forward. Okay, 19.057, an ordinance amending the requirements for marijuana manufacturing in the OI and GI districts by adding air filtration. An ordinance that's sitting in Northampton, Massachusetts, providing the Chapter 350 dash attachments 15 and 16 code of ordinances city of northampton massachusetts be amended as shown below ordinance uses allowed by right marijuana uh, we're striking production and saying marijuana manufacturing all facilities must incorporate both high efficiency pretty good air handlers with activated carbon filters and exhaust systems designed with vents that force air at least 10 feet above the lock roof line of the building Alternatively, another technology, another technology may be used upon finding by the planning board through strike plan approval process that such other technology will, uh, common to the extent practical, limit odors from marijuana in any place where the public or clients are present. Um, is there a motion? Oh, oh, there's a motion. Made by Councillor Klein, seconded by Councillor Nash. <laughs> Discussion. <laughs> So this is the same language, obviously, just for office industrial and general industrial. So OI is office industrial and GI is general industrial. We're a guest. Um, <coughs> any comments on OI and GI? All those in favor of positive recommendation? Aye. 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 No objections? Okay. The last one, 19.058, an ordinance clarifying the provisions for outdoor growing of marijuana. An ordinance the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, find in chapter 350-2.1, code of ordinances, city of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended as shown below. Ordinance amend definitions 2.1 by adding marijuana open slash outdoor cultivation. Growing and cultivating outdoors without greenhouses, hoop houses, or other covered structures with the exception of cold frames or row covers used to start seedlings. Less than 24 inches tall and only between April 1st and May 15th. Accessory buildings to support outdoor growing may be no larger than 1,000 square feet and may only be used for meeting the requirements of the Cannabis Control Commission for providing bathrooms, weighing, measuring, seed distribution, tracking, and other processing activities required for har harvested plants to prepare them for shipment off-site. Is there a motion? Move a positive recommendation. Second. Seconded by Councillor Nash. Discussion. So we currently have allowance for outdoor grow facilities. Um, and the question came up a year ago in Leeds about whether um, a prospective grower could have um, accessory buildings. So that was the first question. And, and along with that was a question about whether they could do it in greenhouses. You know, if that was, and we said, no, that's not what we consider outdoor growing in greenhouses. 
So there was a lot of back and forth. Ultimately, as the administration, we decided no, the intent was not to allow greenhouse growing, that that's really, that's a building and that's for the industrial district. And we really were trying to open up small grower to, to meet the small um, lowest tier in the CCC um, guidelines for um, growing so that farmers, people who weren't you know, part of these bigger multinational corporations could get into the business if they wanted to. Um, so we felt that because we're moving all these other ordinances forward, it made sense to go back and tighten up the language for outdoor growing to make sure everyone understood that it didn't mean that you could have accessory buildings that where you could or greenhouses where you could grow. And the question that has come up since the um, project that was initially proposed in Leeds on another parcel, and there was a little bit of discussion at, sort of at my staff level with the person about whether my interpretation of our code was correct, and they were sure that their interpretation that they could use accessory structures and greenhouses was correct. So it's really just to say, this, is, this was the original intent of the ordinance, was really to have strictly outdoor growing, knowing that it's, it's not going to be a 12-month venture. It's really meant for growing crops like any other farmer grows you know, in this area. So um, that's why there's so much specificity about what kind of um, indoor or hoop structure you could actually use and for how long, and while still meeting the intent of the outdoor growing um, process. Okay. So just um, channeling the neighbors on Kennedy Road, um, some of the things that seem to be potentially missing, I think, from this are questions about lighting. Um, so even if you don't have a structure per se, can lights be somehow used above the plants? Um, and then can you remind me too if there's um, something in terms of zoning about the distance from neighboring um, residences and so forth, because that, of course, is the other huge issue on Kennedy Road. So, um, yes, yeah, so this is, again, sort of really myopic looking at this language. Yeah. It does require a special permit in the Water Supply Protection District and the SR and the RR District. So through that process, the Planning Board would look at those issues of um, lighting, of um, you know, setbacks of buffer and all of those things. So this is not a by right um, prospect. It really still needs planning board special permit. So all of those things that I mentioned are things that would require yes. special permit anyway. Right. Okay. Yep. That's a good one. And this is permissible in, in what zoning districts? The primarily the residential districts of water supply protection, rural residential, and suburban residential. So, uh, and special conservancy. So, so rural residential, special conservancy, water supply, and what, and what else? SR, suburban residential. Oh. That reminds me of another question. Sure. Okay. Um, going back, just kind of, it's this one's a little bit easier for me because there's been so much discussion around a particular facility yeah. that would um, you know, fit <coughs> under this regulation. So one of the other questions has been about the processing in the building that might happen. Mm -hmm. So we have the potential for a thousand square feet of a building where some processing of the plants could happen, correct? And if yes. so, I just want to ask about the, the smell question again. Mm -hmm and if there needs to also be something included here around air filtration and so forth? Um, it's certainly, so. In a residential area. So um, there's, um, the reason why it says processing is because that's the way the CCC regs are written. So anything that, you, when you're doing anything with a the plant, they consider it processing. And um, in a way that I don't think a typical person would consider as processing. 
Um, so I guess two things. One, I don't think it would hurt to say that you have to have filtration. It might be overkill because I, the idea is they really just need buildings to bring product in and keep it safe once it's been clipped and weigh it and measure it and send it out. There's um, processing in the form of turning it into a different product would not um, be allowed here. This is really just about cultivation. So does that language not need to be tightened up then because when you say other processing it seems to leave open a question of what that processing might be. It's because of the CCC regulations and the way they've said processing means blah 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 and all this stuff and I think the city solicitor felt like it was important to make sure we use the same words that are used in the CCC regs. But that leaves open the possibility that even if we're using CCC language that that's something that could be challenged at some point down the line because the concept of processing could is seems over broad. So I'd be a little bit worried about that. I mean, well, I mean, the, the way um, it's written is other processing required of harvested plants to prepare them for shipment off site was to, um, to clarify that it's not about growing them and then, you know, extracting oils or, you know, um, making candy or whatever on that property. It's really about growing them and getting them out to the next stage where someone will take the plants to the next level. Um, you know, I think if you don't feel that it's clear, I don't have any objection to, uh, um, you know, adding that language. I just wanted you to be clear about what the intent was and that um, what we hoped we were covering in here. So does that mean that the planning office wouldn't have a problem with some kind of added language about filtration even for this kind of processing? Um, I, I don't think that that would be a problem. These systems are expensive, so for a thousand square feet, I just don't know if it's overkill because I don't know how much you can really accomplish in a thousand square feet but you also have to have bathrooms and you have to have you know your security lockers or whatever for the people who are working there it doesn't leave a lot of room for anything else um so if the purpose for this is to allow smaller farmers and cultivators to be in the business would something like having to add a filtration system to a small building the size mean it just is prohibitive? To That's what I would be does. concerned about. I would be too. <clears throat> and given the fact that I think this is a very small footprint to have all of those functions happening, I'm not sure how much of an issue that would need to be addressed by that. And there wouldn't be any purpose in adding language that said if <coughs> there, if you know, if any processing was happening that involved the release of, um, you know, smoke, whatever, that would, that a filtration system would capture right. that we'd need it because what we don't want that to be happening, either, right? So, right, as the other would, that wouldn't be happening. The other piece is, again, going back to the special permit piece from the planning board, all of those questions can be answered on a project-by-project -project basis. And it, this absolutely wouldn't prohibit the planning board from requiring something if, based on the model that the applicant was presenting to the board, it um, was um, apparent that odor could be um, significant orders could be created and potentially released without filtration at that site. The planning board could still require that, especially knowing that if the other, if the rest of the package is adopted, knowing that for manufacturing processes, you know, it's incorporated into the zone that you do this um, extraction or, or um, filtration. Um, I think that it's probably more. It would um, create 
less of a burden for those who might not need to have filtration system by not cod codifying it in this provision and allowing it to be incorporated through the planning board special permit process as needed. Um, and the planning board will be clear on this definition and what it's intended for. The right. Place, right. I mean, I think it is, but if you all think that it's not, we can certainly tweak the language. So I'm not, you know, if that's an issue, but I think the, the idea would be, yes, this language then would be adopted and the planning board would be using this as it reviews applications that come forward under special permit in those districts. Um, Councilor Nash and Councilor Goodwill. So having one of the, if you're doing, if you're growing cannabis outside, having one of these buildings is important? It's my understanding that the CCC regulations require certain facilities, no matter what level of operation you're conducting. And, and they're, they're going to require um, bathroom facilities, mm -hmm. and they're going to require a secure place to be able to, because you have to track every, from seed to sale, right. every step of the So way. you can have a farm across town and then your accessory building somewhere else with some yeah. more plants. And then bring them over, right? Because you have like to a, know. like the Schwaz do potatoes. They have potatoes all the fields right. all over. If a there. potato falls off the truck, it's not a problem. Right. If a pound of marijuana falls off the truck, that's a problem. <laughs> so they, you know, they're required to track everything that comes off of that plant. Mm -hmm. And so the only way they can do that is in a closed, right. secure building. And we didn't understand that clearly enough when these original rules for outdoor growing were adopted um, and I don't even know if a thousand square feet will meet I, there's, there's no clear standard from the CCC about how big this is they just need to have so much space for bathrooms and then they have to show where they're going to be um, tracking every piece of the plant and and where they're going to be you know weighing it and and um, what kind of you know container they're going to be putting it in and how much goes in each one and all that. Councilor Nash? So this probably won't be happening in the meadows because the right. bathrooms number right. one also because just building anything in the meadows you need to use some somebody else's footprint that maybe you know an existing right. structure. Mm -hmm. So um, Potentially there's an existing barn and you can convert it. Okay, but then you would have to, if it were in the meadows, you'd have to figure out the plumbing portion. Exactly. Okay. okay. The, the only wording tweak I was wondering about, and the solicitor may not think it's brilliant, but it, the, this word processing in the definition, it does raise possibility of, of other uh, uses. I was just wondering if it were just eliminated. Seed distribution, tracking, and other activities required of harvest as, as opposed to raising the ambiguity of the word processing. Okay. I, I mean, I that makes sense to me. I'll just double check with um, the solicitor to make sure that that's fine. That do that. So are you proposing that? I would propose that as, as, as an amendment Second. to eliminate the word processing in that final phrase. Okay, seconded by Councillor Klein. All those in favor of that amended language. Aye. Aye. Um, back to the bathroom situation that Councillor Nash was just talking about. Is there anything in the regulations about how it, that needs to be tied into a sewer system or any? Could it be a composting toilet? Like, are, how yeah. is that? Could be a porta john. Okay. It could be a porta john. Uh, I I don't know. <laughs> I haven't read that far <laughs> into the weeds, <laughs> but um. Um, I don't see, I mean, anything that's allowed by, by the code, so composting toilets are allowed, um, you know, it's potential. The bigger problem, I think, in the meadows is going to be water, um, and, um, for, for irrigation purposes. Um, it, certainly the parcels that, um, we've looked at. And there's also the other issue is it's floodplain. So some folks have looked at that and thought it's too risky to put my this business in the floodplain. Oh, that's right, the structure. Yep. That's so fine. 
kind of related to the bathroom question. Um, so I seem to recall that there's something about um, plants and other things to shield um, the grow sites mm -hmm. from the neighbors. So does that mean the entire site, so that this building potentially would be shielded as well from site? I don't know that the building, the idea was to, um, they have to secure the crops. Um, and the concern was screening the security measure for that. So, you know, um, if it's chain link fence with barbed wire or something um, that's maybe not really consistent with a residential character or an agricultural character, that all of that has to be screened. It's not really specific to the building. The building could be, at, I don't think, um, I mean, there are cases where buildings don't look so nice, but. <laughs> so that's um, my concern in a residential area, again, on Kennedy Road, where you have residents on either side of this proposed play, this grow facility. Yeah. If they're gonna like throw up a um, cinder block, you know, building yeah. or something like that, that's a real eyesore for the people who have driveways immediately adjacent yeah. to this property. So again, I think that comes into play as part of the planning board role for special permit review. There, there we look at elevations of the building, how close it is to, and how visible it is to abutting properties. Um, I read it, but just to maybe reiterate it, we're talking about April 1st to May 15th. Like that's the entire, all of this discussion is for that window of time. No. The discussion is you can only have a hoop structure over the seedlings for that for limited that window. Okay. And then everything else has to literally be open air cultivation. Okay. And so then that's just however long you can grow. Right. So, you know, there was a whole range of greenhouse type options that people were throwing out. Oh, could I do this? Could I do that? And the idea is really no, this is intended to be outside growing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just to the to the to the point of this the structure, this up to thousand foot structure and screen. If 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 there were otherwise an outbuilding, somebody wanted to put up a cinder block, you know, as their gardening shed, yep. you can do that by right anyway. Right. So it would sort of yep. be. And, and and again, if the idea is to get small growers access to this market, uh, again, I don't want to be too. You know. Put too many conditions on that have that have expense implications. Yeah. So I, I I don't know that we would want to require any special screening of a structure because it's not otherwise there on other outdoor buildings. And <coughs> presumably, so anyway. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I just want to say I share Councillor Klein's concern about out lighting for. I mean, it, it, typically, you know, I'm thinking of the meadows or wherever the farmers are working. That, you know, typically the crop is, you know, it's out there to be out in the sun, and that's the best way to grow it. But with this particular type of crop, that it's so valuable that, you know, it, it could be a, an issue. I don't know. Putting up some lights. Out, out, outdoor grow lights. So. Yeah, I, I don't know. So, do, are there such things? You mean you're concerned about grow lights or you're concerned about Out, safety lights? Or outdoor grow, well, maybe safety lights too, because they're going to have a, I mean, the place that I'm, I'm, you know, looking at the meadows, it would be hard to do it, but it would really look horrible out there, you know, that we have this, <coughs> this <laughs> floodplain going down to the river in the middle of it is, you know, this light coming, you know, this for you know, for grow lights or for safety lighting, or it would be really weird. So, um, and then there's getting electricity out there. You know, we know that there's not a lot of places with electricity, but you know, somebody they got their composting toilet and their generator. <laughs> it puts the diesel smoke ten feet up in the air. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I, I I I think it's just something I. That wouldn't be in the. That would be part of zoning, right? Again, it's, it would be part of the planning board's jurisdiction during special permit review to look at 
all aspects of the project landscaping lighting access um, the building facades you know how it's laid out whether how much parking all of that energy efficiency PV arrays Councillor I guess I would just add, at least in closing, as far as I'm concerned, that I'm, I'm comfortable with proceeding, but with a caveat that all of this seems like trial and error. I mean, this is this is this is a second pass because there were things that not right. anticipated in the first pass, and I'm sure there's going to be a third pass right. as we collectively right. realize, oh, we hadn't thought of that, right. and, or this was overkill, and yeah. so so long as we understand that this is kind of a work in progress, but we need to have something. Yeah, and that's a great thing about being a city and not a town. We don't have to wait for town meeting. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So, so with all with that caveat, I'm comfortable with the way we're proceeding. But I have a feeling we haven't heard the last of this. It's exhilarating. Yes, Councilor Klein. So, I guess in summary, what I would say is, in spirit um, and theoretically, I am absolutely in support of figuring out how we can um, bring small cultivation. Um, marijuana growing to to these kinds of areas but on a practical level and having dealt for two two is it two years already a year and a half with a proposed site and the neighbors and having you know actually walked the property and it's that's why I'm being very cautious and asking all of these questions because I see exactly the things that the neighbors are faced with and it, it is really complicated when people feel like literally in their backyards so they're going to have this marijuana grow facility with a you know potentially an ugly cinder block building and lights and whatever and so I think it just it behooves us to think really carefully and just because I have this very practical you know knowledge at this point it, it does feel very complicated to me so theoretically I absolutely support this and I have concern because you know, my constituents are really concerned, and I think with, you know, with good reason. So I would agree with what you said, and what Council said that this is this will be an evolving discussion probably yeah. for quite a while. Um, but for not for much longer this evening, hopefully. So. <laughs> So we have, this is on the floor of the positive recommendation with the amended language where we're taking out the word processing in the body of it. Um, all those in favor of positive recommendation. Oh, okay. If anyone would like to amend the recommendation, feel free. I see some consternation. Um, this is just a hard vote for me. Okay. All those in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. Uh, okay, so that moves forward. Again, these are, this whole packet of them are going to a joint planning legislative matter meeting on June 10th. It's on Thursday, the 23rd. Oh, sorry. That was the other day. Okay. Oh, this Thursday. Oh, right. Um, here's five, seven, 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 seven yeah. Okay. Um, Carolyn, you're a trooper. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, does anyone have any new business to discuss? Then, is there a final motion? Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor of adjourning? Aye. Thank you.